Good morning, good morning, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, welcome, welcome. Chatty group this morning, this is great. Good morning, good morning, Shabbat Shalom, welcome. This is VBS Torah Study. We're delighted you're here. You're the only hundred people in Encino who don't have the flu. So, thank you. <laughs> we have a few books for everybody. Everybody will need a chumash this morning, so just stick them right over here, thank you. Just put them right on the table there, okay? Thank you, thank you. And we'll pass those around. Thank you. So we welcome you. We're delighted everybody is here. Hope you're feeling okay. Be careful who you hug and kiss. Okay? Um, this morning... Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. That's enough. That's enough. Um, this morning, following our Torah study, you're all invited. There's about four different services in the building this morning. There's library minion upstairs, Tat Shabbat for little guys, a wonderful bar mitzvah in the sanctuary. It's... Uh, Rabbi Taft's niece, who's, uh, she was just here, that young, beautiful young kid. Uh, um, and she's uh, Margulies Altman, Altman Margulies, and a uh, lovely kid. And uh, following service this morning, there's a uh, Torah study with Judy. Come on in, come on in, come on. Come on. And uh, the course of this week, um, tomorrow, Sunday, there's a Chavura fair. People who would like to join a Chavura. Or you can get it, you want to swish in over here? Find a, join a Chavurah, meet some other folks. There's a, a, a gathering tomorrow. You can grab a flyer in the hallway. Uh, on Wednesday night, we continue with the College of Jewish Studies. We're studying a survey of Jewish history. Uh, and our guest Wednesday night will be Moses Maimonides, um, <laughs> the greatest Jewish philosopher who ever li lived. It was really hard to get him. But, you know, you, you send enough invitations. Eventually, the guy who emails you back, you know, and... Uh, so he's coming, well, he's busy. So his best friend, Dina Aronoff, who's a professor in Berkeley, is coming. Uh, she's a wonderful teacher. and he's, he's the greatest, interesting Jew of the world. So please come Wednesday night. That's at 7 o'clock. Um, Friday night, we're going to do this a little bit backwards. Martin Luther King's day is on Monday, uh, but we're going to celebrate his birthday on Friday night. And Friday night, we're joining with the, the nice folks at Beit Shuva. The Beit Shuva community is coming here to VBS. Uh, and Rabbi Mark will be here. He'll be teaching and we'll be um, joined by the choir from the faith, it's, I forget, the, there's four words, Faith Central Baptist Church. It's in, Faithful Central, Baptist faithful, faithful faithful Central, Central, Central Faithful, the greatest gospel choir you ever heard. <laughs> no, I, I, don't know, I don't know the name of the church, but, but I've heard the choir many times. Come on in, guys. And the choir is out of this the phenomenal gospel choir, just yeah. remarkable. Dr. D was a wonderful musician. We're going to do that at 7.30, so please come and join us. It, it'll just move you to your core. And especially, you know, if every time you turn on the news, you just get heartbroken and dispirited, um, to regain a sense of Martin Luther King's greatness and his vision and his passion and for social justice, uh, please come and enjoy that. I think it'll be a wonderful evening of, of learning and celebration. So it's Friday night at 7.30. And then the following Friday night, which is the last Friday night of the month, uh, we'll celebrate Shabbos Shira, and we're going to be putting on uh, Chris Harden's jazz service. Our music director, Chris Harden, is a gifted, gifted musician and a composer, and he's written a marvelous jazz setting of the Friday night service, and we're putting that on together. And that'll be on, on the last Friday night of the month. Okay? Those are the events that I can remember. Um, the Neshama Minion is going on their retreat next weekend, so anyone who's a woman in the community who'd like to go and spend a weekend learning and praying and getting to know one another and growing. That's a beautiful experience. It's at Brandeis Bardin, and there's still room if you'd like to go. And then we're taking a trip to Israel in March. Anyone who'd like to go to, Mar to Israel in March with me? Uh, it's a, not a trip for first-timers. If you've never been to Israel before, there's better trips. We'll send you on one. Uh, but this is a trip for people who really know Israel a little bit and want to know Israel better. The issues and the, and the dilemmas and the and the successes, the, the tr triumphs that have made Israel Israel, we spend an issue a day, take a whole day on international security, a whole day with Palestinians, a whole day with the ultra-Orthodox, and then at night we go to fabulous restaurants. Um, that's sort of how you combine this. So anyone who'd like to come, there's still lots of room on the trip. Just, uh, there's a flyer now for it. It's March 7th through 15th, okay? We're flying on the 6th, arriving on the 7th. We take a week together. You can stay longer if you want to go to Eilat and sit in the sun. Uh, or go to, I wouldn't go to Egypt if I were you, but you can, you can go to lots of other places. Or you want to get there before we get there, we'll meet you there. It's a wonderful opportunity. How's that? Okay?
Good. We are in the middle of the book of Exodus. So if you have a Chumash, if you don't have a Chumash, I got a bunch of extras today. Ellie, you want Chumash? Come get a Chumash. Okay? Now, in order to understand this Torah reading, we have to imagine three different ways of looking at the world. Three different maps that one might use to sort of navigate life. Let's start with the one we use. The modern map of the world says that the world is governed by a set of forces which we call nature. Natural forces. Natural forces are complex but predictable. Natural forces are complex but immutable. They don't change. Gravity is gravity. Gravity is for good people, and gravity is for evil people, but it's always the same gravity. I told you, I once got on an airplane at LAX, and there was a lady there, and she said, aren't you Rabbi Feinstein? And I said, yes. She said, oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> I said, honey, you want Sullenberger. You don't want Feinstein. Anything happened with this airplane, all I can do is recite Kaddish. I mean, you know, you're basically screwed. Because gravity doesn't care if you're a rabbi. I mean, gravity just, you know... Gravity doesn't care if you're a rabbi. We got a chair for the gentleman? Yeah. Okay. Gravity doesn't care who you are. Gravity, you know, it's gravity. And, and, and the idea, the whole notion of, the, the whole modern notion of scientific, the mo modern scientific notion of nature is that nature is impersonal. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't play favorites. Nature is impersonal. Nature is, come on in. Sherry, you're going to need to get a couple of chairs because we're running out of chairs. Yeah, Yo, good. Someone with chair, a chair, I hope. <laughs> oh, hey, go, go get some, there's some chairs in the other room. Just go, 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 left some chairs, yeah. So nature is immutable, doesn't change. Nature is impersonal, doesn't recognize you. Nature is complex. So that's why the weatherman says, gee, we didn't expect this, right? We didn't expect a storm of this magnitude, or we thought it was coming Tuesday and it arrived on Wednesday. It's complex, so which makes it hard to predict, but it's predictable. In the end, you can look back and you can say, all right, here's why that happened. Even so-called medical miracles sometimes happen, right? A person is very sick and they wake up in the morning and ask for breakfast. You know, medical miracle. Well, the doctor will tell you why it happened, right? Certain things happen within the body and the physiology of the person. Certain things happen with the response of drugs. Certain things happen. We have taken that notion of an immutable impersonal, predictable nature, and we've applied it to social circumstances as well. There's such a thing as social science. So the first social science is economics. The social science of economics can predict mathematically certain conditions of the marketplace. Anybody take economics in college? Remember, there's laws of supply and demand. There's microeconomics and macroeconomics, right? right? Mr. Altman can tell you how much, an, how much a house ought to cost in a neighborhood. If that house sells for appreciably more than that, he wants to figure out what happened. Now, sometimes there are unpredictable things because you're dealing with human beings, and human beings are unpredictable. Sometimes they build ridiculously large houses in pretty Encino neighborhoods <laughs> that are way out of the neighborhood, but some, idiot, some person decides to build that house, and he has to figure out some way to sell it because it doesn't fit the neighborhood. But that's what you deal with human beings. They're irrational. They, 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 they make choices that are hard to imagine, but you can pretty much predict the way marketplaces respond, and sometimes you can even predict human behavior in certain circumstances. And that's what the, the notion of social science is to try to apply the same idea. And we, we can look at a social phenomenon and, and understand it. What were the causes of a war? What were the causes of a peace? What were the causes of a particular social phenomenon? This is the language of science that was once developed for nature applied to the human realm, right? And then when you get to the personal realm, you get psychology, so we can understand certain individual decisions based on the causes within a person's psyche, the person's you know, personal universe. So what my, my daughter deals with, okay? She's a psychologist, so, and she deals with irrational people and she tries to make them rational. She has a long career ahead of her, right? <laughs> now, that's, the na that's our way of understanding something. So if something happens, we say, well, well, there were causes for it, and here's why it happened. How did the ancient world look at phenomena? 
I want to suggest that in the ancient world, the pagan world, you have a three-layer three layer map of the world, okay? The, on the bottom layer, you have what happens to us, the things that happen in our world, people's decisions, events, all the things that happen to us, right? The, the notion was that above or beyond our world was the, was the realm of the gods. And there were multiple gods. And, and what they meant by gods were centers of power that, that, that were the, the locus or the address for a certain force that affected our world. So you talk about a god of war or a god of peace or a god of fertility or a god of rain or a god of thunder. And there were multiple centers of power and they competed with each other. They're always competing with each other, which puts us in a very difficult position because if you want to make it in this world, you have to figure out which god to align yourself with, which team to root for. If you align yourself with the god of rain, which seems perfectly reasonable if you're a farmer, the god of sun gets pissed off at you. If you align yourself with the god of, 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 of sun, then the god of rain gets you. You have to figure out how do, you, how do you deal with that. But you're always dealing with these multiple centers of power. Multiple centers. Now, there's one more level above that. There's a level of power above the gods. In different civilizations, it had different names. It was called Ma'at in, uh, in Babylonia. And, and that is the realm of a powers that, the fates in Greek, in the Greeks, the, the powers that are even above the gods. Now here's the game. If you can figure out how to manipulate those powers, you can figure out how to manipulate the gods to do what you want to do. And the art of god manipulation is called magic. Magic is the art of knowing how to force the gods to do what you want them to do. That's what the art of magic is. You're going to go above the gods and use those, those higher powers to force the gods to produce results that you want produced. That's why magicians occur in all these ancient civilizations. Oracles. Because they're going above the realm of the gods and they can use that. Now, if you're a powerful guy, you want to use the gods, force the gods to do your bidding. That's the great game of magic. The world center of magic in biblical times was Egypt. Egypt was the Detroit of magic, right? It was the Microsoft of magic. I don't count. Think of another metaphor in a moment. But that's where you, if you needed a magician and you needed a spell or a pub, I mean, after all, what is a spell? What is a potion, right? You wave your, your magic wand and somehow you force the forces of the world to do what you want them to do, right? That's magic. That's the pagan world. Now, we would look at that and say, what? Crazy. You know, why did, why did, why did this person die? Because they were sick. <laughs> right? Why did this accident happen? Because the two things came together at the same time. And, and, and modern, we don't accept, moderns don't accept that stuff. We look at that as superstitious. But there's still superstitions in the world. I don't know how many of you are sports fans, you know? But sports fans are the most superstitious people in the world, right? I wear the same jersey every time the Packers win, right? And I haven't changed it in 38 years, right? And th this notion of, 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 of superstition means I still believe that there are these forces in the world controlling things. Retire the number. What? Retire the number, right? That's it. Now, comes along the Bible and offers a third map, a different map of the world. What's the Bible's map of the world? The Bible's map is we live on this level. There's no God level in between. There's just one God. <laughs> and that God is moral. That God judges things based on morality. One God controls everything and, control, and, and, and can't, be, can't be manipulated. You can't manipulate the God of Israel. You can ask him for stuff. You know, who, you know, you can ask for, for healing, you can ask for peace, you can ask for prosperity, and God might or might not listen or, or respond to the prayer in the way that you want it, but you can't, you can't manipulate that God the way the magicians manipulate the gods of the pagan world. That was a revolutionary idea, and it was impossible for them to understand any more than it would be impossible to understand the whole notion of science, which is our, our, our map of the world, right? And what you're going to see in the Torah portion here is the confrontation of map two and map three, the pagan map and the Israelite map. 
Pharaoh is a dyed-in-the-wool pagan, and a good one, too, thank you very much, because he's, as not only is he the chief political ruler of Egypt, he's the chief, he's the chief religious officer of Egypt. He lives in the world of the gods and the forces that... Been, and he, he has all of this manipulation at his fingertips. And this idea that there's a god above all of his gods, beyond all of his gods, that controls things, is beyond his imagination. And not only is that god beyond the powers that he can manipulate, you know whose side that god is? You know whose people that god is? You ready for this? Slaves! I mean, the least that God could do is sponsor rich people. The God of rich people. That makes sense, right? I mean, after all, if you were God, who wouldn't you want to hang out with? You want to hang out with rich people, right? You would imagine that God would be on the side of the powerful and the well-connected and the, and the rich and the, and the important uh, uh, slaves? Insignificant, inhuman, chattel slaves? Are you kidding me? I mean, so you have to understand that from, the, from Pharaoh's point of view, when Moses comes before him and says, thus says the God of Israel, let my people go, that is a completely incomprehensible claim. It is, it's, not just that he, it's not just that Pharaoh's evil and he resists it. That's our point of view, because we're seeing the story through our eyes. But from Pharaoh's point of view, it makes no sense at all. First of all, who is this God? He's not in any of my God catalogs. No, we have God catalogs. You know, you look him up online, you Google him. So, so, so he says to Moses, what's his name? I'll Google him. Well, he doesn't really have a name. Well, come on, guys. You can't do that. Gods have to have names because that's how you manipulate them. You use the name of the God to manipulate him. You put him in an amulet. You put him in a charm. Right? You wear them on your forehead, right? So first of all, you tell me that this God doesn't even have a name, and number two, that this God can't be manipulated, and number three, that this God is more powerful than all of my gods? This makes no sense. Then number two, the second thing is, this God wants me to do what? Let slaves go? What? Hello, come on. If this God showed up in my front yard and said, I want you to build me a monument to me, all right, that I'd understand. I'm good at building monuments, right? Sphinx, pyramids, you name it, I'm good at it. Obelisks, right? You name it. But let my people go? What? <laughs> what? Hello? Slaves. And then the third thing is slaves. Sla slaves are slaves. Slaves are slaves because that's what they are. That's like somebody showing up in Encino and saying, I want you to let all your dogs go. <laughs> Thus says the Lord of dogs. <laughs> let my dogs go. You say, what? It's my dog. I feed him. I take care of him. You know, woof. I walk him. He poops on my lawn. Him you care about? <laughs> like, what? what? <laughs> me? Talk to me, you know. It, it's, you, you have to understand how incomprehensible this is to the pagan, to, to, to Pharaoh. And if you can get that, it, that and watch what happens, because what's going to happen in this Torah portion is, this is the Torah portion where God says, hello, the world has just changed. What this Torah portion is all about is how do you switch your map? Now, it took Europe 500 years to switch from the superstitious pagan map to the modern scientific map, and lots of people still haven't made the switch. No, no, it's true. I mean, think about all of the weird, irrational things you read about. It. You know, read the National Enquirer, <laughs> right? You might as well, because it's all fake news anyway. So. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, the, 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 the people still believe in leprechauns and, you know, and, and, and evil spirits. and so it's Still people don't, you know, it, we, we all have this irrational streak in us, right? I, I mean, <laughs> go to Las Vegas. It's this capital of irrationality, right? But... But what? Yeah. So, so it, we, we still haven't adopted a scientific point of view. It's taken us, imagine what it's like for Pharaoh to have to do this like quickly. How do you change your whole orientation of the world? That's what this Torah portion is about. It's the clash between these two orientations. Does that make sense? Open the Torah. Let's have some fun. Ready? Yeah, it's 351 actually, Vaera. So there's two Torah portions that are going to tell the story of the Exodus. It's the two middle ones. There's, there's four Torah portions that tell the story. Last week, Shmot, we were introduced to the whole thing. And then this week, Vaera, and next week, Bo, we're going to, 
we're gonna, it's the story of Pharaoh's education. Except what I'm gonna say to you next week, I'll say to you now so you can be awake for it next week. This week, it's about Pharaoh's education. This week, all God wants to do is show Pharaoh who he is, who God is. Next week, God gets mad. It, God really gets ticked off. You'll see this at the end of this week. Because by the end of this Torah portion, Pharaoh gets it. You'll see this in a minute. And by next week, Pharaoh, God says, okay, now I'm not fooling around anymore. The gloves come off. The first six, seven plagues, right, up until hail, it's God like messing with Pharaoh. I mean, come on, frogs. That's, like, that's just messing with Pharaoh, right? Right? Bugs. Ooh, you know, icky, but nothing, not fatal, right? Hail is fatal. You'll see that in a minute. Locust is really fatal, right? Darkness is super fatal. And then the death of the firstborn is by definition fatal. It's like this week, God's just messing with him. And next week, he crushes him. It's the end. It's, it's the fourth quarter, right? So watch what happens, right? So we start out with Moses. At the end of last week, Moses comes back to God and says, what did you do this to me for? And really what Moses says at the end of last week's Torah portion is, you know, the people get angry at him for, for increasing their burden. And, and he says to God, like, who are you? So we have a little introduction about God. God you know, God says, I am the, I, I, God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, Ani Adonai, that's the point. It's yud Hey vav Hey. that's my personal name. And, and there's a part of me which I never let your ancestors know, but you're about to discover who I really am. Turn to page 352. I've heard the moanings in Israel because of the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. I've remembered my covenant. Say to the people of Israel, I'm the Lord. I'll free you from the labors of the Egyptians and deliver you. I'll redeem you. I'll bring you to the land. And when Moses told this, 353, when Moses told this to the people, they wouldn't listen. Their spirits crushed by bondage. So poor Moses now is caught between a people that won't believe him and a Pharaoh who won't believe him. Now, if everybody in your world tells you you're insane, <laughs> does that ever cause you to stop and think? It's like, you know, the guy who calls into the radio station and says, I don't know what's going on. Everybody on the freeway is driving the wrong way except me. <laughs> you, know that, you know that guy, right? I, 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 so the people tell him he's insane and Pharaoh tells him he's insane. And the only person in the world who doesn't think he's insane is his brother, who's probably insane too. And the question is, am I insane or am I really looking at a new map of the world? The Lord spoke to, Pharaoh, to, to Moses saying, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites depart. But Moses appealed saying, they won't listen to me. They won't listen to me. If the people I'm supposed to liberate won't listen to me, how the hell is Pharaoh going to listen to me? Right? So, Mo, so the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. And then there's, it breaks for a moment and gives you a genealogy, just so you'll remember who these characters are. Okay? And now come with me to page 356. Now comes, this is round one. Round one. Ding! The Lord replied to Moses, I place you in the role of God to Pharaoh. That's an interesting phrase, right? Right? Re'ina taticha Elohim le Pharaoh. You're going to rule over Pharaoh. You're about to crush Pharaoh. And Moses thinks he's insane. That I, I must be nuts because no one believes me, right? And Aaron will be your prophet. And you'll repeat all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh and let the Israelites depart. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and marvels in the land of Egypt. And when Pharaoh doesn't heed you, I'll lay my hand upon Egypt and deliver my ranks, my people, my Israelites from the land of Egypt with extraordinary chastisements, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. It's no longer a political thing. It's not actually even about the Israelites anymore. It's not even about the Israelites. They're going to get out. That's true. But that's not the point of this exercise. What's the point of the exercise? Change the map. You got to know that the world you think you live in is not the world. And you have to know that the, that the role you think you play in the world is not real. I'm going to show you there's a different way to think about the universe. And remember, it's really hard to do that. It's, if you've been right-handed your whole life, it's really hard to start using your left hand. And if you've been seeing the world this way your whole life, it's really hard to see it a different way. It's going to take a lot of practice, right? So, verse 8, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says, Pharaoh says to you, produce marvels, take your rod, cast it down. 
Remember, oh God, the movie, George Burns plays the Lord, which is a great casting decision. Just wonderful. Morgan Freeman was good too in the other movie. That would be an interesting film festival. <laughs> Actors who play God, right? That's interesting. And, and what happens is you know, he's in court. Remember this, this scene, he's in court and the prosecutor says, how do I know you're God? He says, oh, I'll make a sign. He says, well, make a sign, make a miracle. He pulls out a deck of cards, pull, pull a, take a card. <laughs> that's just what, that, that's just, so make, a, make a miracle, right? It'll turn into a serpent. Snakes that, sticks that turn into serpents, right? And Aaron cast down the rod in the presence of Pharaoh, and it turned into a serpent. And Pharaoh, for his part, summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, the Egyptian magicians, and they did the same, and each cast down his rod, but Aaron's rod swallowed their rods. Ooh. Yeah. Come on, guys. Give me a little ooh here. <laughs> Come on. So that's the point. This is like, you know, magic, contest of magic. That's the point. It's not about a contest of magic. Who has the biggest magic trick? It's about who, who, who rules this universe. Then why let them do it? What? Oh, because that's the language of Egypt. You gotta play the language, you gotta play along. Oh, yes you do, you gotta play along. <laughs> come on, Gelman, you gotta, you gotta, what? Crush them. No, 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 you're coming Start to that. With no, you're Start with lice. Start with lice. Well, actually, that, that, that actually happens. That actually happens. You wanna get the end? I'll give you the end. Okay. Right, okay, I'll tell you, here's the end. Okay, turn to page, where did I put this? Yeah, turn to page 366. So here's Gelman's point. It's always good to tell Gelman that he was right. Because so much of my life is telling him he's wrong. So <laughs> it's always good. When he's right, it's rare, but it's wonderful, you know? And you believe it sometimes. I know, I know, it's you amazing. Don't always believe it. I know, it's when you produce snakes and sticks and yeah. stuff. That's it. So we're going to, see, this is the end of the narrative. Look at the end, and we'll come back to this, okay? Because... Start where Pharaoh is, where Pharaoh says, I don't know who this God is. That's where Pharaoh starts, remember? I don't know who this God is. I don't know who you guys are. And I don't know why you're appealing on behalf of a bunch of slaves anyway. Come and have a shower and something to eat, and I'll send you back out to the desert and stop bothering me, <laughs> right? And that's how, that's how the whole drama starts. Well, Pharaoh's kind of benign. He says, look, I, I'm not going to make it trouble. But, the, you know, you guys don't have any standing in my court. Get the hell out of here. And at the end, this is what happens, right? Look at verse, page 366, right? This time I will send my, all my plagues upon your persons and your courtiers and your people in order that you may know that there's none like me in the world. I could have stretched forth my hand and stricken you and your people with pestilence and you would have been effaced from the earth. Nevertheless, I have spared you for this purpose in order to show you my power, in order that my fame may resound to the world, but you continue to thwart my people and do not let them go. And then, that, this is the switch from the fooling around plagues to the really serious plagues. This time tomorrow, I will rain down on Pharaoh, you know, complete destruction. The end of the narrative is, I, I could have done it in one plague, but, but I knew that it would take more than one, I don't want to destroy you. I want to change your way of looking at the world. I don't, I, and, and it's interesting, by the way, that that's the narrative. That's the purpose of the narrative. That's not just the purpose, that's not just God's purpose in the story. It's the purpose of the whole book. I don't want to just destroy you, but I want you to see the world in different terms. And that's going to take some time. That's a very slow process. So the, let's go back where we were before. The first stage in that process is your magic tricks don't impress me. Because I can big, do better magic tricks. But it's not a matter of magic tricks. It's a matter of looking at the world differently, right? And the Lord, look, I'm on page 358, verse 14. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's coming out to the water and station yourself before him at the edge of the Nile, taking with you the rod that turned into a snake. Now, you have to know that this narrative is a very deep narrative. One of the things about this narrative is this story that's written in the Torah is that it's full of secrets. It was written over generations, and it's full of secrets. It's full of winks. Can you wink, right? It's full of winks to you. One of the winks to you is this contest between God and Pharaoh. Who does Pharaoh think he is? God. He thinks he's a god, and he thinks he's a more powerful god than the god of Moses. After all, 
The God of Moses is a God of slaves. Pharaoh is the God of the greatest superpower in the world. He conquers continents. Who is the God of slaves compared to the guy who commands the armies that conquer continents? Now, all of you who live with middle-aged men, what, what, if, you want to, if you want to impress a middle-aged man with his humanity, his lowly humanity, his humble, hum, humble humility, what time, where do you go out and meet him? First thing in the morning, right. Because the first thing any middle-aged man does is go out to the river and do his thing, right? That's exactly right. So here is, this is, you're not having fun with this. Come on, <laughs> guys, come on, right? I mean, here, this guy thinks that he's God, but like every middle-aged man, he gets up in the morning and runs to the toilet <laughs> because there's a power more powerful than him, right? Is, right? <laughs> And, and so where is Moses waiting for him, right? So here's Pharaoh, you know, you know and here's Moses and Aaron going, morning, Pharaoh. <laughs> Small hands, hmm. <laughs> Mighty kingdom. Small, uh, small hands, you know. And then there's this whole thing about take your rod and you get the picture. I'm not, I'm not being base about this. The, the Bible's winking at you. He thinks he's God. Yeah, really? God? <laughs> you know? That, the, that's the point. You see what's going on? Now, what's going to be the first plague? What are you going to smite? What's the first plague? No, no, first plague, first plague. Right? Let my people go. They may worship me. Pay no heed. By this you'll know that I see that I strike the water of the Nile. I strike the water of the Nile. What's the most powerful geographic force in Egypt? The Nile. The Nile is what shapes everything of Egyptian civilization. You strike the Nile, you're striking the heart of its civilization. And the Nile was worshipped. It's not even that the Nile was worshipped. The Nile was the lifeblood, literally the lifeblood of Egypt. Out of the Nile came the gods. The god Osiris was born, just like Moses was, in a basket coming down the Nile. The Nile was life itself. You go out and you strike the Nile, you're striking literally the heart of Egypt. And it's so interesting. And what do you, what, what do, you do to it? You turn it into? What was the first thing the Egyptians did? They enslaved the Israelites and they took Israelite babies and threw them into the Nile. If you throw babies into the Nile, if murder becomes a societal project, if murder becomes the collective project of a civilization, you can aptly say that there's a river of blood running through downtown Egypt. And all of these sort of metaphors are included in the plague stories. That's what all of these are. You, you, you killed our children, and now you are a bloody civilization. You're a bloody civilization. I just, just to take a step back for a moment, so this weekend we commemorate the birthday, the 89th birthday of... Martin Luther King, read his speeches. This should be liturgy. We should do this as liturgy. Go back and read his Nobel Prize address. It's even better than the I Have a Dream speech. Go back and read his speeches. King says, racism isn't just a problem that afflicts America, a, a black America. Racism is a problem that afflicts all America. Racism is a curse on all of America. It is a slavery. It is a slavery of all of America. And it's a problem not just for black people, it's a problem for everyone because it impedes the progress of the American dream. It keeps us from being the people God meant us to be. It enslaves all of America, and we haven't fixed it yet. We're still stuck in this, right? Still stuck in it. The, the, the notion of a plague as a, as a metaphor for the consequences of collective evil. And, and the Bible's aware of that because the image is, of a, of, a, of a river of blood running through downtown Cairo. You get the picture? So what happens? What happens? But you paid no heed. I'm on 359. I'll strike the water of the Nile, and then my hand will turn to blood, and the fish will die, and the Nile will stink, so that each will find it impossible to drink the water of the Nile. And the Lord said, say to Aaron, take your rod, hold it out. There's that rod again, right? Hold it out over, over the waters of Egypt, just so you don't think this was an accident. Its rivers, canals, ponds, all of its bodies of water, they'll all turn to blood. 
And there'll be blood throughout the land, even in vessels of stone and wood. And Moses and Aaron did it, and it stank, and no one could drink. But, look at page 360, when the Egyptian magicians, verse 22, when the Egyptian magicians did the same with their spells, Pharaoh's heart was stiffened. So they could, rep they could replicate this. And because they could replicate it, it still fit into his way of life. So he could still think that this is the God of Moses, right? The God of Moses and not the God of the world. That's the, that's the problem. It's a, it's, he's still stuck on his map. He's still stuck on his map. Seven days passed. The Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, let my people go. They may worship me. If you refuse, I'll plague the whole country with frogs. Now, that's an interesting one. Frogs, right? Why frogs? The Nile will swarm with frogs. They'll come up and enter your palace, your bedchamber, your bed, right? And the houses of your courtiers and your people and your ovens and your kneading bowls and frogs will come upon you and upon your people and all your courtiers. Why frogs? What, what's, the, what's the wink? What's the inner meaning, the metaphor of frogs? Right? What was the frog? Well, it seems that Pharaoh is taking the life blood of Egypt and he's going to see uh, who saw it. I'm not sure if... These aren't French people. These are Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah. If it were French people, they'd be delighted to have frogs everywhere. Yeah. Hola! Dinner! <laughs> you know? He's taking it from... Zutalo! You know? It's coming from the water. It's going into where all the Egyptians, ah, good. All the Egyptians good. are. Good. Really good. Good. So one of the things you see is it's the violation of a boundary. Where do frogs belong? In the water. In the water. Where do they end up? On the land. Oh. Stuff that belongs on the water ends up in the land. Stuff that belongs outside ends up inside. We human beings live with a set of boundaries, right? I love nature, except when I find ants in my kitchen, right? Nature is really good as long as it's outside, right? When nature comes inside, it makes me very uncomfortable. It gives me this icky feeling. We live with a set of boundaries. In the world, you need boundaries, right? So what the first thing is that frogs violate the boundaries. What's outside comes inside. What's natural becomes and enters the human realm. Even the intimate realm, the bedchamber. The bedchamber is the most intimate place. That's the cleanest place you want, right? That's the place you want all the icky stuff outside. I want my bed to be pristine and clean. Right? That's why there's reports about bed bugs. Give us the willies, you know? And I want it nice, I want clean sheets and clean bathrooms, right? And all of a sudden, it's filled with the, the outside. There's no boundaries anymore. Now, what was Pharaoh's complaint about the Israelites? Yes, at the beginning, what was Pharaoh's problem? The Israelites. Paru v'yishritzu v'yirbu. They were swarming. They were swarming a lot like bugs. And there were Jews everywhere. My God, you turn on television, you see Jews. You walk in the bank, you see Jews. You, you go on the, you, you watch a sporting event. Well, they don't play, but they're agents. You know, they're <laughs> Jews, you know what I mean? My God, are these Jews everywhere. Couldn't we just gather them all up and put them in one place and, 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 and let, the, let, let, you know, let the society be clean of Jews? Everywhere you go, they're Jews. Sound familiar? So I want to limit their fertility. I want to limit their mobility. I want to define them and confine them and control them. And so the plague is uncontrolled fertility. The same thing that he complained about the Israelites, that's the plague of frogs. It's uncontrolled fertility. And the fact that the frog was a god in Egypt of fertility, it was the symbol of the god of fertility. You're striking down the god of fertility. Now, there is a textual thing here which I have to tell you because otherwise it, you'll miss it and, and, and you won't know the... Um, take a look at page 361. Anyone here like monster movies? When I was a kid on, on, on Saturday afternoons on Channel 11 at 5 o'clock, was Monster Theater. And my dad would come home from work and my brothers and I would sit down with some chocolate ice cream and every week we watched giant grasshoppers, giant frogs, giant bunny rabbits, giant crickets, Godzilla movies, 
come and they would, every week, it's the same movie, right? You know that movie? Anyone watch those movies? <clears throat> they don't make them anymore, but in the 50s they used to make them so they're on TV late on a fat Saturday afternoon for guys like me. And so the story goes like this. The, the opening scene is a couple making out at Lover's Lane in the guy's pickup truck. And all of a sudden they hear a funny sound. And he says, I wonder what that is. I'll go out and see. And we're sitting in front of the TV going, don't, don't do it, don't do it. And he goes out and you hear, <laughs> and you know, oh, geez. And she says, Bobby, Bobby, are you there, Bobby? And she knows that he's, that he's oh, ah, you hear a scream. She gets in the car, she turns the car on, she drives to the sheriff's station. Yeah, ma'am, can I help you? A giant, fill in the blank, cricket, frog, and bunny rabbit just ate my boyfriend. Oh, honey, now calm down. You kids are always messing with us. You know, Bobby, go out and see if you can find Bob. They're all named Bob, you know, <laughs> in that part of the world, right? So Bobby goes out in the squad car. <laughs> station to Bob, station to Bob. You st did you find him there? Sheriff, something's wrong. Bob's not answering. So they go out, and that's the moment that they're It turns out that the nuclear reactor on the corner went. <laughs> well, I haven't gotten that there yet. Wait. It doesn't matter. Come on. People do many great things. I know, I know, I know. But your version <laughs> of the 1950s monster movie is the greatest <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Sheriff? The nuclear station has been dumping the heavy water in the creek, and now we have giant fill in the blanks, right? <laughs> Crickets, ants, grasshoppers, whatever. And then they come out, they figure out, here's the story, page 361, ready? And the Lord said, to, this is why I'd give you this. The Lord said, say to Aaron, hold out your arm with the rod over the river and the canals and bring forth the frogs. And Aaron held out his hand. In verse 2 in Hebrew, Vayet Aharon et Yado al Memei Mitzrayim. He held out his hand on the waters of Egypt. Vita'al Hatsvardea. Literally, the frog came out of the Nile. Not a zillion, trillion, million little teeny guys. One gigantic Godzilla frog came out of the, you have to imagine the eyes come out first, right? <laughs> and here's Pharaoh, and here's this enormous, come on, guys. <laughs> They're not enjoying this like I am. <laughs> no, the Rambam thought that one uh, frog. One enormous. As big as Egypt. As big, one enormous. That was the medieval view. Ribbit. <laughs> <laughs> Ribbit. Right? And then the Midrash is that. The that, frog that ate Egypt. It's exactly right. This is the giant frog. This is the Godzilla frog, right? You know, in, a, in, in the Japanese movies, their mouths always marry all, you know, Gazira, Gazira, right? <laughs> so he hits it with his stick. Pharaoh hits it with his stick, and it divides into two. And he hits it. Every time you hit the frog, you get two of them, which is an interesting metaphor about evil, right? If you, if, you know, if you do something wrong and you try to cover it up, the cover-up always makes it worse than what you actually did. I'm not being political, I'm just saying this, right? Right? You know? It, yeah, go ahead. that if you try to force evil to stop itself, and then you leave, yeah. it'll reconstitute. Right. If you try to force it back into the Nile, right? Get back, back, back! You know, go back where you belong, right? What happens? You end up with more, right. You can't, you can't suppress it. You have to acknowledge it. You can't pretend it's not there. Right? Now that, I'm going to make a really bad jokey, right? Because if you pretend it's not there, you're practicing denial, see? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Forget about it. He brings out the best in me. All right. What's happening to Pharaoh all this time? What's happening to Pharaoh all this time is that his vision of the world is changing. Take a look now, just as an image, just as a, as a commentary to this. The, the Haftarah, every week when we read Torah, we read a designated portion of the Torah. In the, in the first sec centuries, the rabbis of the Talmud assigned a section of the prophets to accompany every Torah reading. So that in the, any morning, you would read from Torah and from prophets, and in the course of a year, you'd get a pretty good education in Bible. 
So we have a, a designated prophetic section for every Sabbath morning. And because it's read at the end of the Torah reading, it's given the word haftarah, which means the closing reading. So the closing reading, the haftarah, for this week comes from the book of Ezekiel. Okay? And if you'll take a look with me, it's on page 370. Page 370. Now, who is Ezekiel? Ezekiel's a very strange man. I mean, really strange guy. He is a prophet of the exile. In 586 BC, 586 before zero, the Babylonian Empire conquered Jerusalem, and they took the leading classes of Jerusalem off to Babylon, and they settled them there. That was the way that you pacified an enemy territory. And by the waters of Babylon, there we sat and there we wept, says the psalm, right? Because we settled there. But the Babylonians basically let us be free there. In, in the course of that experience, in the Babylonian community, the Babylonian, the first great diaspora Jewish community, the first Jewish community separated from the land of Israel, there's a prophet by the name of Ezekiel. And he has wild, crazy visions. This is one of his remarkable visions. Now, one of the things that was going on politically at this point was the, the Judeans, the Jews who were settled in Babylon, blamed their fate on the Egyptians. Because what was happening is you had two great empires, Mesopotamia and Egypt, and you'd play them off against each other, and we were expecting the Egyptians to rescue us from the Babylonians, and they didn't. So he's angry at the Egyptians. But more than that, he has this ancient anger, and he writes a midrash. He, Ezekiel, writes an, a midrash in the Bible about our very Torah portion, right? So if you just, it starts out, thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they've been dispersed and have shown myself holy through them in the sight of the nations, they'll settle on their own soil, which I give to my servant Jacob. Ezekiel, living in 586 BC, is looking back a thousand years. And he says, our experience here in exile in Babylon is precisely the same experience as our ancestors in Egypt. The purpose of our exile is the same purpose played by our ancestors' enslavement in Egypt. It's an opportunity to, for God to show that God runs the universe. Because there never was a time when a slave people were pulled out of another land and settled, resettled in their own homeland. And we're going to eventually be pulled out of Babylon and resettled in our land. And that's how God is going to show that he's in charge of history. Now, look to page 371, the, the section on the... Uh, no, but look down that page. Look down that page. In the chapter 29, you see it? In the 10th year, the 12th day, of the 10th month, that's since the exile. The word of the Lord came to me, mortal, turn your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against Egypt, and speak these words. Thus says the Lord God, I am going to deal with you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, mighty monster, sprawling in your channels, who said, my Nile is my own. I made it for my self. What's the image? What's the image? It's a crocodile. The Nile is full of crocodiles. The idea is Pharaoh's a giant crocodile, right? And what does Pharaoh say? It's my Nile. I made it. My Nile. I made it. So what does he say? I will put hooks in your jaw and make the fish of your channel cling to your scales. I'll haul you up from the channel with the fish of your channel clinging to your scales and I'll fling you in the desert with all the fish of your channels and you will lie open, ungathered and unburied. I have given you as food to the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and all the inhabitants of Egypt know that I am the Lord because you were a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they grasp you with the hand, they'd splinter. So he's talking about this Pharaoh's arrogance you think you're a god? You think you made the Nile? Let me show you how the world really works. The point of this Torah portion is to change a map and to try to get Pharaoh and the world to see that it's not this, these gods that you can manipulate, but one, and this one god who judges the world on the basis of morality. And that is a revolutionary idea in the world. Bobby, welcome home. Hi. OK. OK, good. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. It was. It was excellent. And um, uh, I'm really taken with your um, overview of the concept of change, of changing paradigm. Yes. Um, and the uh, context you gave at the beginning um, of this morning. Uh, right. I want to ask you um, a simple question. Right. How, do you, how does one survive change? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. In various ways. But if you want to do it in a healthy way, yeah. how, and, and I'm asking you. Now, I think it's a very important question. So let's, let's go back just a moment to the, uh, to the holiday we're about to, to celebrate. Some of you are old enough to remember George Wallace and Lester Maddox and James Farmer, Lahavdil, you know, and the civil rights battles of the 1950s and 1960s, right? Okay. I, I, just to give you, a, just, just to, to bring this, there's all these wonderful movies now, Hidden Figures, The Help, uh, the one about Jackie Robinson, which give our children a sense of, of what America was like pre-civil rights and, and what it was like to be an African-American in, American, in American society um, pre-civil rights, right? And, and for our kids, it's, it's a movie, and it's hard for them to imagine this, right? I tried to explain to my kids. About five years ago, a young uh, running back uh, from the University of Alabama, right, won the uh, Heisman Trophy, right? Mark Ingram won the Heisman Trophy. is the big uh, uh, award in college football. Mark Ingram won the Heisman Trophy, and he was celebrated as the first time that a University of Alabama player had won the Heisman Trophy. And he was given the award, and I'm weeping, and my kids said, Abba, what, what, you crazy? And I said, he's black. They said, yeah, well, of course. I said, no, no, you don't understand. George Wallace stood in the gates of the University of Alabama and said, George Wallace was the governor of Alabama, said, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And it took the United States Marine Corps to bring the first two black students to the University of Alabama. And now, a generation later, a young African-American man wins the Heisman Trophy, and he's embraced by the whole university, right? They blew away Medgar Evers. They blew away three civil rights workers. They, 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 they blew away Martin Luther King. And now, I, all right, we're, we're not done. I mean, the, the process of, 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 of racial equality in this country isn't finished. It's, we're in the middle we're in the middle stages, and frankly, where we have to go now is much more subtle, in many ways much more complex than what it was in the 1960s, but you've got to see that as some sort of progress. How did that happen? How did that happen? And how hard was it for Southerners particularly, for Southerners particularly, to look upon their African-American neighbors as equals and not as boy? Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but I'll take that. I'll take it, though. Look but, what happened but, to Charlottesville just a few months but, ago. But you're right. So that's why I say we're not done yet. We're not finished yet. This is still an ongoing process. But, but you can see a change in a map, a change in your attitude, a change in your outlook, a change. It's a fundamental change. It's a fundamental change. When the Civil War ended and, and, the, and, with, and, the, and with the Emancipation Proclamation, it freed slaves from one kind of slavery, but it put them in another kind of slavery. And, and African Americans have still not busted out of that kind of slavery yet, but there's been change. And how does that change happen? And how difficult is it to have? You just, you just have to imagine this. And you, you go back and read the statements of people pre-civil rights. King was afraid for his life every day of his life from the day he showed up in Birmingham with Rosa Parks, I mean, his wife kept telling him to shush, still be quiet. He was afraid he was going to die, right? And he, he got resistance. The resistance he got wasn't just from southern white racists. The, the worst resistance was from other black preachers who told him, shush, still, you're rocking the boat, you'll make it worse for us. Sound familiar? Same thing they said to Moses, right? You, you're making it worse for us, shut up. It'll happen in 150, 200 years. You read letters from a Birmingham jail. I mean, so the, the question is, how does change happen? So one of the ways that change happens is somebody has to stand up and demand it. Right? The, the, well, the, 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 the I have a dream speech, the line in the I have a dream speech who says the, the ferocious urgency of now. It's a great phrase. The ferocious urgency of now. Because the opposite is what they call gradualism. And that's what the black ministers of Birmingham asked him to, to sign on to. And he says, no more. No more am I going to take my kids to an amusement park they can't ride the roller coaster. No more I'm going to drive the highway and can't check into a hotel. No more I'm not going to be able to sit and have a meal with my family. 
No more. I mean, it, it takes somebody to do that. Dangerous place to be. Because nobody, it's the same Moses. It's, I mean, the Moses character, nobody, nobody believes you. Everybody thinks you're insane. You're insane. Right? I have a dream. <laughs> I mean, in a certain way, we read that speech now because of what happened subsequently. But, you know, I have a dream. But, you know, it, a lot of people thought he was insane is what they thought. It was a nightmare. Elon. Really? He's coming here. Yeah. No, no, not Hitler. Uh, no, Steve Ross, the guy that wrote the book. Hitler's dead, um, to my knowledge. Steve Ross is the professor who wrote that book. Is coming. Is, College of Jewish Studies. Is Okay, good question. Take a look. Take a look. Take a look. Take a look. That's, that's the purpose of this narrative. The purpose of this narrative, the, perp the reason why this story is here, is to say to you, it's possible. To say to you that change is possible. That's exactly the purpose of the narrative. Look at page 367. Okay? We'll get to the end here. Elon, the question is a brilliant question. And the answer is difficult answer because it would be much easier to be both cynical and skeptical and, and say to you, you're right, it doesn't change. But it does. And, and, and the question is, can it change? Does it change? Look, the, 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 the pagan map, the pagan map, that was map number two, the pagan map of the universe, was largely a map that was static. Pharaoh lived in a static world. He didn't want anything changing because he's Pharaoh. And he controlled everything. The notion is it's a static map. When you introduce a god of Israel, you introduce dynamism into history. History changes. It's incredibly difficult to imagine that history can change. It's incredibly difficult to imagine that people would change. It's incredibly difficult to imagine that a slave could become a free person, or that a southern black who's used to shuffling and keeping his eyes down and never engaging stands up straight, looks a white man in the eye and say, I'm your equal. It's incredibly difficult to imagine that. I'm gonna to suggest to you that the purpose of this narrative is not only to establish faith in God, but faith in change. Faith in the plasticity of history, the capacity of history to accommodate change, and the capacity of people to accommodate change. Look, what, look at page 367. Moses brings hail. Now, this is the beginning of the, the second set of plagues, the really serious ones, because hail, it, it, well, you'll see what, let's, let's go back to the hail plague, because I like this plague a lot, right? Right? Look at page 366, verse 18. This time tomorrow I will rain down a very heavy hail such as not been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Therefore, order your livestock and everything you have in the open, brought under shelter, every man and beast that is found outside, not having been brought indoors, shall perish when the hail comes. So what does Moses give him that he didn't give him before? Warning. It's coming, and you can, you can keep your... But, but in order to... In order to to listen to that warning, what do you have to do? You have to believe Moses and not Pharaoh. You see, he's dividing his people from him. Tell your people, because if they don't listen to me, they're going to die. And, they're gonna, and, and, and now he's dividing them. And it's a question of whose map do you believe, right? Those among Pharaoh's courtiers who feared the Lord's word brought their slaves and livestock indoor to safety. But those who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the open. And Moses said, hold your hands out, and holy hell came down from the sky. It's fiery hail, whatever the hell that is. And it destroyed everything that was vertical in Egypt. You get this picture of buildings and plants and trees, everything wiped out. Hiroshima. It's exactly right, because the next is coming, the locust, which really is Hiroshima. So if you brought the, your stock and your slaves into the building, 
And the building collapse, what the value is that? Yeah, well, if you, if you brought them in, they, would, they, they saved them. I, have, I made sure of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> look at now. Look at verse 27 on 367. Ready? Thereupon Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I stand guilty this time. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Now, what does it take for the king of Egypt to say that? You've beaten him. That's what the whole purpose of the narrative was. I want to show him that I'm God. Okay, you're God. I get it. But then the heart gets... Wait, hard. wait, wait. We're not done yet. That's... Come on, come on. There's no change. No. God is undermining no. the very thing, yeah. which is the opportunity for change. Yes, right. Say, yeah. change is possible. Yeah, then yeah. why hard... Pharaoh's heart. Ah, because we're not done yet. Because that this this because <laughs> symphony because this symphony has to come. I like the nuclear bunny midrash. Yeah. <laughs> because this is philosophy. The symphony. This is my zone. The, you're right. So so the at this point we've achieved the tshuva that we wanted, right? But watch what watch what happens to Pharaoh. Pharaoh starts handling with him. He says, "Okay, worship your God here." Or take, take, you go out and worship, but don't take your kids. And he's, he's, he's not ready yet. He's still not finished, but he's starting to change. He's starting to change. That's what's my, go ahead, please. Well, as an answer and a question that kind of go together, which Good. is that part of the answer of change is intergenerational, getting to generations that don't have the same preconceptions to the same extent, which is why the one learning the desert later. Yeah. But also that goes to your point of timing of um, why harden the heart and all that because it couldn't happen that fast. But my question is more on a divine scale. Why did God wait until this time to change the mess? Yeah, good question. I don't know. This is the narrative. I mean, this is the story. This is the narrative. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I can't tell you that. I, th this is the narrative that we have, right? And remember, we've talked about this over and over again. Who tells this story? We tell the story as our story, but we tell it as a story of triumph. What we really ought to be asking the question is, we're not finished changing the map yet. The map's not done yet. Because if the map were done, then we would look upon each other with very different eyes. But the fact that we're so still good at dividing us from them, our folks from those folks, right? People from certain countries and people from other countries, to quote an American leader. Right? The fact that we're still so good at differentiating and instead of seeing human beings as human beings, as creatures of God, we're still so good at judging. We're not done yet. We're not, we're not, we're not done with the project yet. And the plagues that come now are different kinds of plagues, but there's still plagues coming. So to get you to look at the world differently. I, I don't know. I think that the, the notion is this, is this is the ongoing project. This is the great ongoing human project. Yes. Uh, why harden the heart? <clears throat> I, we talked about this at, at our Shabbat table last night. Oh, good. And we, there are four different reasons, I think. Hardening is hard? Hardening is hard. Yes. One is what you said. It wasn't done yet. God wants to show signs and wonders yeah. and, and change the map. Right. Second reason is punishment. Yeah. God wants to make sure that he punishes them. <clears throat> Third reason is to reduce Pharaoh's free will. Yeah. Take away his free will, and the fourth reason, paradoxically, is to increase Pharaoh's free will. What do you mean? Allow Pharaoh yeah. to do yeah. that which he wants to do anyway. Yeah. So, so Maimonides agrees with your three and four. Maimonides said, if you look at the narrative carefully, it says five times Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then it starts saying God hardened his heart. So the notion that Maimonides says is, if you get into a habit, if you get into a pattern of evil behavior. You eventually get stuck in that pattern and can't reverse it. And that the ultimate punishment is very naturalistic in this sense. It's, that's map number one, which is that having gotten stuck in a pattern of, of self-destructive behavior, you can't stop yourself. You literally can't help yourself. Maimonides language is God removes the possibility of tshuva. You remove the possibility of tshuva, right? So my dear friend Mark Borowitz, who's the rabbi and spiritual leader of Beit Tshuva, you know, I'll send him people, I send him people all the time, and, and he'll interview people, and the question he wants to know is, do you really want to get sober, or are you just here because your mother sent you? You really going to want to get sober. 
And, and the only time a, a, an addict wants to get clean or, or a drinker wants to get sober is when they hit rock bottom, when there's no farther down you can go. Then the person says, khatati, now, now I'm ready to change. But so the question is, because up until then, you'll always find an excuse, a rationalization to do it again. Right? My father, who's doing better, thank you very much, my father's midrash on this, because we discussed it at our Shabbos table, was Lyndon Johnson. Poor Lyndon Johnson knew in 1967 that the Vietnam War was lost, and yet escalated, escalated, escalated. Why? Because you're stuck in a pattern. You're stuck in a pattern, and you can't break out of it. Part of that pattern is the information that's coming to you is wrong. Part of that pattern is this is your only reflex. You don't know any better. Part of that pattern is you don't want to look anything less. I don't want to be the president that lost Southeast Asia. I don't want to be the pharaoh that lost the Israelites. Right? That's the pattern. That, now, that's a naturalistic way of reading what's a supernatural narrative. But that's one way of thinking about it. And that okay? only explains pharaoh hardening his own heart. No, but it explains. It doesn't explain God hardening his. Well, heart. because the language because of hardening his yeah, heart, yeah. he takes away moral responsibility. Okay. You aren't morally accountable. Well, if you aren't morally free, is an addict it's morally similar. accountable, Mark? What is an addict morally accountable for his addiction? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. At a certain point, at, a, at so so even though he's compelled by an inner drive and a pattern of behavior, he's still morally accountable. Yes. All right. So we agree. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Onus doesn't take away. Yeah. From that point of view, if you look at it from Tuva, maybe it was Israelites who were at the bottom and God helped them grab the boat. Well, it, it's not the Israelites who have to do the Tshuva. They have a Tshuva to do as well, but we'll get to that later. That's the book of Numbers. This is, this is Pharaoh's Tshuva. This is Pharaoh's change of heart, change of map. It's his change of map. He keeps reverting back. He thinks there's some way to manipulate your way out of this situation, to, to use his kingly power and remain king. He's not willing to recognize that there's something bigger than him in the universe, that there, that there are principles under which he has to operate to. This chapter is, this, para, this, whole, this whole Torah portion is about the education of Pharaoh. Next week, when we come back, you'll be glad to know we're going to smash him. Right? <laughs> Next week, we're going to take him out. And the question is there, and, and Rabbi, Rabbi Gelman's question about why we needed to do that, and what's the effect of that, and what's the meaning of that, and what happens to the Egyptian people. And, and the question I wanted to look at next week is whether or not the Bible recognizes a difference between Pharaoh and his people. And at a certain point, we start to have a little rochmanus on his people, right? Anyone have a Pesach Seder? You dip out the wine? Why do you dip out the wine? Well, there's some ancient reasons for superstitious reasons, but why do you dip out the wine? What's the ostensible reason why? Right. Isn't that interesting? Rahmanis for Egyptians. You have a sense of mercy for the Egyptians because the leader, the leader may have drawn them into, into a terrible, into a terrible cul-de-sac, you know, but the people didn't need to suffer. So the question is, at a certain point, does the Bible say, you know, I, I have this tribal, tribal joy in watching my enemy grovel. But there's a better part of me which says, no, people don't have to suffer. We'll take a look at that. That's going to be next week's conversation. Have a really good Shabbos. Take good care. Come